how much biodiversity can be protected within urban nature sanctuaries. Today's video is going to go through some absolutely incredible top of the line research to determine how much biodiversity, particularly reptiles and amphibians, can be found inside of a single urban nature sanctuary. And I say the research is incredible because it's mine. Uh, so this is my uh, one of my first publications, and I thought it'd just be a really great way to uh, break down some of the work I've done, but also talk about a really cool project. So I did this in undergrad. Uh, it's a herpetological survey of Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary. Uh, I loved this project, I did it for a quick year. It wasn't the craziest project, but hey, I did it, got it published, uh, and it was part of the Undergraduate Research Scholars Program uh, at Texas A&M University, where I did my undergrad. And uh, the other co-authors on here are Bethany Fauché. Uh, she was my contact at the park, uh, and uh, Lee Fitzgerald, who was my uh, advisor. Uh, and this was at Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary. This is in the heart of downtown Houston. Uh, I always, it was such an interesting plot of land because it was largely undeveloped. Um, at least the park itself. They, they they try to keep it as natural as possible. If you've been there, you may know it's, it's a wonderful park. Uh, I loved the community that was around it. There was just so much going on. But what I was interested in uh, was what species of reptiles and amphibians are found at this park. And I wanted to do good surveys of it. And the ultimately, the way I did this, so I had the best of intentions of setting out traps as well as doing visual encounter surveys. Uh, so the traps were largely going to be set up at this blue circle. There is a pond there, uh, and we would set out these minnow traps basically mesh traps that are usually used to catch minnows, but you can also use them to catch frogs, catch turtles, catch snakes, uh, really anything that goes inside of it. Uh, we ultimately had to get rid of the minnow traps because you, you bait them with, uh, we use dog food, and just put a little dog food inside of a little pouch, put it in there, uh, and it attracts fish, which then attracts the predators of the fish, like snakes or whatnot. But the problem was that it attracted raccoons, and the raccoons just tore out the dog food, and then the traps were everywhere, and it just became a problem. So we had to get rid of the traps. So ultimately, this was just visual encounter surveys. And this is that red path that was along the way. Um, essentially, there was one trail system that I could really take, so I would randomize which direction I did it uh, every single time, where I'd start it, uh, and then I usually try to do it in the evening time. So uh, I didn't have no much. Yeah, this is that. Uh, however, manipulation by raccoons, procyon loader, ultimately required traps to stop being baited. Um, so yeah, I just stopped baiting the traps. I would still get occasionally stuff in this. And uh, I do detail pretty extensively how I did this project. So I actually used a survey that I put on my phone so I could very quickly take pictures. And the cool thing with this, because it was a community park that many people love to go to, I also uploaded everything to iNaturalist. So you can see pretty much all of the observations from my project on a community science website. Um, actually, let, let's, let's show that real quick. So we're on iNaturalist right now, and this is the uh, map page, and I want to show where Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary is. And it's very easy to miss because it is this tiny little park right here. Uh, again, very close to the highways. So here is the Sam Houston Tollway, and here is the 10. Uh, and yeah, very small park, especially when you consider it to other parks in the area. So that's why I thought this was such a cool uh, system to study because it shows that you don't necessarily need huge tracts of land to maintain species. Uh, you can have these little pockets. These are urban islands. Uh, of course, big tracts of land are better, but you can still have it even with 18 acres, less than 20 acres. Um, and if we get out of this, again, this is iNaturalist, it shows all of the observations from this area. And if you go back to, I believe it was like 2017 when I did this project, maybe 2018, um, you'll see all of my observations uh, that I uploaded. So this is just a checklist of species, but you can go to the actual observations, and you can see people are uploading stuff even to this day. Uh, so yeah, I, I just thought that was a really great way of supplementing it, uh, or supplementing the paper, but also I used iNaturalist observations in order to find the checklist of species here, because I only surveyed for one season, and that does not capture it. Now, that does not capture all species, so using iNaturalist allowed me to supplement my data and get a better picture of what's going on at this park. Now, I do want to note something very, very uh, interesting. So, the literally the day, um, yeah, in August of 2017, so this is when I surveyed, immediately prior to the survey date, I'm talking the day we were supposed to go down there and survey, um, we were hit with by Hurricane Harvey. 
Uh, so if you know, Hurricane Harvey went through and pretty much just flooded Houston like crazy. Uh, we actually were on the trail a couple weeks later and we were we were asking them, well, how bad did it flood here? Because there is a creek that goes right through the middle of the park uh, and it was 15 feet. The, the trash line was 15 feet over our head. So the park was completely flooded, which was really unfortunate in some regards because, um, well, you know, it, it displaced species, no doubt, but also we wish we had some data before that so we could tell directly before and after what is found after a flood, but of course, we didn't get that information. So my methods were pretty simple. I just walked around, I found the species, and then I noted them. Uh, basically, I do, 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 do. So this is the survey dots. These are every single observation I ever found. I believe green were my own. Oh, no, red are survey datas and green are iNaturalist data. So red are species that I found. Of course, you'll find some in random spots. This is because of GPS accuracy. We're not particularly concerned if the species was found um, at this side of the park or the other side of the park. We were just looking at, hey, what's found here? And of course, because I found it in the park boundaries, I know it was within the park and I know this is a GPS snafu, right? Um, but... Uh, we actually, for this paper, we needed to talk about every single species. So like Raina catesbiana, which was the, uh, which is the, uh, bullfrog, American bullfrog. Um, we have to list out like how many we found, how we identified them, how we identified them from other common species for this particular journal. Um, the paper I published. So here's some other pictures. Uh, so we got Raina clamatans and Cilius nebulifer, Gastrophrine carolinensis, uh, Raina sphenocephalus, Luthorodactylus cystin and noise, and then your Raina catesbiana, your American bullfrog right here. Um, we also, of course, got plenty of reptile species. Um, so we did get a couple snakes. We did get some uh, banded water snake. We got some brown anoles. We had uh, a really nice snapping turtle, a cup, a lot of turtle species. Turtles, I think, were the most common thing we found on this survey. Um, and table one of this paper lists absolutely everything that we found. And so what was really cool about this, because I was using both survey and iNaturalist data, it offered a great comparison for, hey, how do surveys compare to iNaturalist data, right? Like, like, how do they differ? Because iNaturalist is very opportunistic, right? And surveys are very much so not so. They are very much so we're going to go out and we're going to find stuff. So what I found is that, of course, iNaturalist found some species that I did not. And after the flood, what we found is some very common species we were not able to detect during the survey. So we did not find your eastern hog noses, which were known in that park. Like, it was known that they are there and everywhere. Uh, same with the uh, your plain belly water snakes, Nerodia erythrogaster. They are super common. Didn't find any. In fact, the only uh, snake I found, I believe it was just the uh, banded water snake. I think that was the only snake I found. Um, did I find anything else? I'm looking at the paper right now. Oh, no. I did find some uh, rough brown, uh, some, some rough earth snakes. So we found almost no snakes that whole survey. It was primarily turtles and frogs. But on the flip side, we did find some species that were not found on iNaturalist prior. So we found a pretty good amount of the Eleutherodactylus cisodethoides, which is this picture right here in E where I'm holding them. Uh, these are technically an invasive. It's considered a range expansion, depending on who you ask. Um, that's the Rio Grande chirping frog. And we found five of them over the course of the survey. Um, other species that we did detect that were not found on surveys, I believe there was one more. Um, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Terrapin, Carolina. So we did find some, uh, some like, box turtles, uh, but nothing, nothing crazy. Um, and then there were also some, uh, of course, like I mentioned, species that were found uh, on iNaturalist, but not via the survey. Uh, now, of course, they are in iNaturalist because I uploaded them there. Uh, so all I had to do is filter them out. But yeah, this was a, a fantastic little project, and just, just to give you an idea, I did this in my undergrad. Um, I was very fortunate in that I applied for a program, the Applied Biodiversity Conservation Scholars Program, and I got accepted. In fact, everyone who applied got accepted. Um, this was kind of a thing where if sometimes you just need to do the work to, to 
get the rewards from it, right? And uh, I was very fortunate in that I kind of got a lot of free reign on designing this project. I really got to figure out how to design my own project as an undergrad, and this tremendously helped me out. Uh, that, that program also gave me funding for this as well as an internship, an internship that was uh, dramatically impactful. Uh, I was in Belize, I was down there for three months, and it was something that I would never have been able to afford w without that, like just, just point blank, I, I could not have afforded that without this program. Um, and that, you know, I've gone to Belize almost every year since. I'm actually leaving again in three days, hence why I'm recording this. And you may be wondering why all my clothes are the same, because I'm batch recording videos. Um, but I also wrote this up as a thesis, as an undergraduate thesis. And now I've been having the pleasure up until recently. I recently uh, quit. Um, but I used to review these theses for undergrads. And it's, it's, it's just showing that I, I, I firmly believe that you need to get started in research early and your projects do not need to be grand. Um, I always, whenever I was talking to my students about the program, the, the research that I did when I was in their shoes and now reviewing their thesis, I told them my project was I went out to the woods, I looked for frogs, and I found frogs. That's what my research was. And of course, there was a lot more moving parts. There was getting the approval process, which took months and months and months. Uh, there was the actual designing of the surveys and having to adapt the surveys when the fucking raccoons, like, destroyed my traps. Um, but all in all, uh, I think that we need to have more simple projects in biology. I say as my master's project has ballooned into some unwieldy monster. Um, but I, I ultimately think that this project set me up for a lot and really helped me out. So if you're wanting to do your own project, it's as simple as going out and doing your own. Uh, try to find funding, but hey, work with organizations and uh, you might be able to get something published as well. Also, check out if you're starting out or if you're in an area um, where you know spending two or three thousand dollars for publication is just un unreasonable, check out Pensoft. I love Pensoft Publishing. They have a bunch of different journals and it's all online, it's open access. And the fees are very, very reasonable. I think for this one, which was Checklist, the Journal of Biodiversity Data, which we have a couple publications in, uh, the fees are only like 200 bucks, which feels very appropriate. Uh, granted, the data for here is just, what do you find? Like, hey, you go out to an area, what species are there? Or range extensions, which we have another one. That'll be another video shortly. But cool, just wanted to share this research uh, for you today. And yeah, have a good day.